<laughs> hey, wow. This is something I usually don't see. The specialist barber know you're sitting in her chair. Engineer Walker, specialist barber, knows all about it. <laughs> Apparently, Commander Collins is going back to Earth today, and so they wanted to finish some space monopoly game. So uh, since the both of them did that instructional lesson, I told them I would fill in for her morning shift. Yeah, well, she really must want to finish that game. I mean, she's very protective and possessive about her comm station, you know. Engineer Walker, really, it's just a communication station. It is no different than any other command center here at Spacegate Station. Okay, if I were you, I wouldn't repeat that while Specialist Barb is around, especially since she helped out with that introduction lesson. Oh, that reminds me about the introduction lesson. Um, how come uh, you were able to weasel your way out of participating in the instructional lesson uh, and got Commander Collins to do it for you? Dr. Carafano, I am confused. A weasel is a mammal of the genus Mustella. The genus Mustella includes weasels, polecats, ferrets, and minks. Members of this genus are small, active predators with long and slender bodies and short legs. I am unaware of such an animal on board the station. In addition, Engineer Walker is known to be fearful of small furry animals. Therefore, I would find it highly unlikely he would retain one as a pet. Oh, Roy, that's ridiculous. I'm not fearful of small, furry animals. Engineer Walker, may I remind you that when Dr. Pinnock's experimental mice accidentally escaped from their cage in the lab, you locked yourself in your cabin for two days until they were all accounted for. I, I was just protecting my cheese that my family sent me from Earth. That's <laughs> it. Uh, uh, Aurora, uh, Engineer Walker does not have a pet weasel. Uh, what I meant was, is uh, I was using another idiom. Uh, you see, Engineer Walker very cleverly was able to get Commander Collins to do his part in the instructional episode. Uh, the idiom relates to the fact that weasels are very, very sneaky animals. Thank you for the clarification, Dr. Carafano. I will note this idiom for potential use in the future. And Aurora, also in the future, don't go spreading rumors about me being afraid of small furry animals and stuff. I will refrain from pointing out your baseless phobias to others in the future, Engineer Walker. Thank you, Aurora. At least I think. Hey, Dr. Carafano, if you don't need any help, I got some rewiring I need to do back at the bus. So, if you're okay, I'll just leave you to it. Oh, no problem, Engineer Walker. I've got this covered. I mean, it's the communication station. How difficult could this job really be? Ah, uh, yeah, you remember you said that. Dr. Carafano, I am showing a frequency mismatch alarm on the low gain antenna. Uh, I'm aware of that, Aurora. Dr. Carafano, the automated resupply module is requesting docking clearance. I, I see that, Aurora. I I'm going to get to it in a minute. Dr. Carafano, NASA is still holding for the present navigation file download. Aurora, I only have two hands. I'll get to it in a minute as soon as I can. Dr. Carafano, it seems you have shut off the station's navigation beacon for incoming space traffic. Which button was that? Uh, Aurora, this console is being very, very finicky. Just give me a minute. Dr. Carafano, you have activated the station self-destruct sequence. Self-destruct will commence in five minutes. Wait a minute. Uh, Aurora, our station does not have a self-destruct device. That is correct. I just wanted to confirm if you were listening to my announcements. 
You appear to be ignoring the information I am providing you regarding station status. Very funny, Aurora. I cannot believe you put a colony on Saturn. Yeah, but that wouldn't have happened if you wouldn't have landed in space jail. <laughs> Wow, I haven't seen this much commotion on the flight deck since I tried to land a T-7 carrier in a hurricane back up off the coast of Bermuda. What is going on with my station? Why are these alarms all going off? Oh, so that's what that switch is for. Oh, well, uh, things got a little busy and then slightly out of hand. And, you know, I think we need to do a system check on Aurora because she has not been very helpful this morning. I have just had a completed diagnostic system check four days, three hours, and 15 minutes ago, Dr. Carafano. I don't think Aurora's the one that needs the checkup. Can I have my seat back, please? Oh, um, absolutely. <laughs> please do. And uh, actually, you came here in the nick of time because Commander Collins and I have to do an instructional lesson, and uh, we actually need to hurry along and get that done. Well, I'll be happy to help you in any way that I can. What have you done to my workstation? You know, we probably should hurry along. I think Specialist Barbara is going to be real busy for a few minutes. Uh, she needs some alone time. I mm -hmm. can't wait to get started. Uh, are these coffee stains on my console? Uh, there's peanut butter on my high-frequency transmission dial. Ugh. Aurora, are there any communications on hold or pending at this time? There are 84 communications either on hold or pending at the present time. What? I am not letting that man touch the station ever again. No Space Monopoly game is worth this. Dr. Carafano and Commander Collins, I have initiated the recording for our students. Thank you, Aurora. Well, students, welcome to Spacegate Station. I'm Dr. Carafano, the Chief Science Officer here at Spacegate, and today with me is Commander Collins. Now, Commander Collins is the mission commander for the spaceship Defiant, and the Defiant's job is to transport personnel and equipment from Earth to the space station and back again. Today, she's going to be helping us learn about something that's very important. It's called precision and accuracy, and it really helps us in the areas of math and science. She's also going to go over something called the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, or ASCII, which is essential to how we work with our smaller computers here on the station. Commander Collins, where should we begin? Well, Dr. Carafano, I think it's first important for us to explain to our students what is meant by precision and accuracy. You see, precision and accuracy, they're two important factors when it comes to us taking data measurement. And both accuracy and precision, it reflect how close a measurement is to the actual value. So why is that important? Well, in math and science, when we're counting for human error, we're counting for data processing errors, it is so important that we get close to the actual value. That way we're able to make corrections. You know, that makes sense because in math and science, our goal is to understand nature, and we do this through a process of exploration, discovery, and very importantly, experimentation. Well, yes, that is correct, and I think Aurora could help us explain what we mean. Aurora, could you explain for, to us what is meant by accuracy? An accurate measurement has no error. Accuracy is how close a measured or calculated value is to its true and correct value. An example of this would be a person with a bow and arrow shooting at a target and trying to hit the center of the target. The closer they are to hitting the center with the arrow, the more accurate they are. That is very well done, Aurora. So perhaps now you can explain to our students, well, what is meant by precision? Precision is how consistent results are when measurements or calculations are repeated. This has to do with carrying out a process in the same consistent manner each time it is done. This term does not relate to how accurate the answer is, but if the same answer or result is accomplished each time. Using our prior example, precision is how close a second arrow is to the first one, 
regardless of whether either is near the center of the target. Thank you, Aurora. That helps it make a lot more sense. So you'll notice that on um, Aurora's last slide, Dr. Carafano, the um, archer was hitting the same place repeatedly. Now, it was nowhere near the center. Well, that makes sense. So the archer was being precise, but not accurate. That is correct. But, you know, you see in this situation, you can make the same mistake over and over again, and you can have the instructor change that so that we can get a better accurate measurement. Well, Commander Collins, what if the archer was neither precise nor accurate? Well, Aurora, could you pull, pull up that last slide for me? As you can see here, the archer is neither precise nor accurate. Their arrows are hitting everywhere. In this case, it would be much harder to correct the student. We would probably want to have them take up another sport. Well, that makes a lot more sense about precision accuracy, and I think our students probably have a better understanding now. Perhaps we should now move on to the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, or ASCII. Correct. Uh, now, Commander Collins, why do we use ASCII here on the space station? Well, you see, not all computers are the same. For instance, the computers that operate the SpaceGate engine, well, they're very small, almost like a small calculator. And so with, to control these types of computers, we must give them instructions using the hexadecimal code. Hexadecimal. Uh, that's kind of a new term. I tell you what, Aurora, could you explain to our students what uh, Commander Collins means by hexadecimal? I would be happy to, Dr. Carafano. Hexadecimal is a base 16 number system. It is a different method of representing numbers than the base 10 system that humans use in everyday practice. In base 10, humans count in multiples of 10 before adding another digit. While computers process numbers using base 2 or binary system, it is often more efficient to visually represent the numbers in hexadecimal format. This is because it only takes one hexadecimal digit to represent four binary digits. Thank you, Aurora. That does make it a lot clearer. Perhaps you could explain to our students now, Aurora, the relationship between hexadecimal and the ASCII table. For text files to be stored and processed by all computers, it is important that they all interpret the data in the same way. A standardized method was created that defined what numbers should be used to represent all the characters in the English language. This method was called the American Standard for Information Interchange, or ASCII. The ASCII table defines all numbers between 0 and 127. The numbers from 0 to 31 represent non-printing characters, meaning characters that are not directly displayed. These characters control how the data should be interpreted. That is a very good explanation, Aurora. It is important to note that non-printing characters, they are primarily used to give instructions to monitors and printers so that they can print text in a certain way. That is why the terms resemble the keys that are on a keyboard. You know, Commander Collins, it would probably be a good idea if we actually demonstrated to the students how this process works. Here we have an example of an ASCII table, which converts characters to hexadecimal. Notice in each row on one side, we have the characters, and on the other, the hexadecimal equivalent. This first column of the table shows most of the non-printing characters that Aurora mentioned before. The remaining columns primarily contain both all the numbers, letters, and other characters that you would need to give the computer directions. Note that there are different numbers for both capitalized and non-capitalized letters. As we look at the demonstration sheet, you see a line of computer instructions. We have colored each part of the instruction sequence to make it easier for you to follow. We have also added separation bars as well. These are parts of the instructions that we would give to the booster engine computer here on the SpaceGate station as part of the commands to fire the engines. The commands are start of text. That tells the computer we are giving it a line of instruction. Device controller one. That activates the system that handles the incoming and outgoing signals. M23, which is a navigation location. End of text. 
That tells the computer this is the end of the line of instruction. Null, which tells the computer that the rest of the instruction fields are blank and we are giving it no more information. Now using the ASCII table, we convert this information to hexadecimal. Start of text gives us the number two. Device control one equals number 11. M23 must be broken down to its individual characters. Capital M equals 4D. The number two equals 32. The number three equals 33. End of text equals three and null equals zero. We then combine all the hexadecimal numbers in order into one long string of code, which is what we actually input into the station's engine computer as part of the instructions to operate the engines for a boost maneuver. The number string is 2114D323330. That was a great job, Commander Collins. I think our students probably have a much better understanding of how we use the ASCII table to convert text into hexadecimal for our computers. Students, uh, we provided your teacher a practice sheet that will actually allow you to practice converting text material to hexadecimal using the ASCII table. Now, one of the things that we included is we gave you the format that we use here at SpaceGate Station to speak to our engine computers so they can boost our station into higher orbit. You know, Commander Collins, I really appreciate you coming out today and helping us with our instruction with our students. I hope you can come back again sometime so we can even give more information to our students about math, science, and space. Well, you know, I'm so glad that we had a chance to speak with Aurora directly. It was a tremendous time saver. I agree with you there. Well, Aurora, I guess this concludes our instructional lesson today. Uh, why don't you go ahead and end the recording here? Instructional recording is now terminated. So then she tells everyone that I'm afraid of little furry mice. But you are afraid of little furry mice. Yeah, but she didn't have to tell everybody about it. I mean, jeez. Hi, Commander Collins. Hey. Uh, I see you're done with the introductory episode. Um, what happened to Dr. Carafano? Well, he told me he had a very tiring night and needed to go lay down after we completed our lesson. Tiring. Tiring. It took me over an hour to get the station cleaned up, and I still have peanut butter on this emergency frequency dial. Okay? So I'm telling you, no game is worth all of this. The station will never be the same. Well, it sounds like you have a bone to pick. Uh, oh, oh, no, no. Oh, she did it again. Processing. Processing. A bone is any of the piece of hard, rigid body tissue consisting of cells embedded in an abundant, hard, intercellular material which makes up the skeleton in humans and other vertebrates. The concept of picking at a bone dates to the 16th century when the term was used to refer to a dog chewing endlessly on and picking clean a large bone. In the context used, it would seem that Commander Collins has observed that specialist Barber wishes to perform cannibalism, which is the act or practice of humans consuming the bodies of other humans. I believe such practices are presently illegal. Uh, no, no, Aurora. Commander Collins was just using another idiom. Miss Barbara's not going to be picking any bones clean. She just has a grievance that she has to talk over with Dr. Carafano. Interesting. I will retain this idiom in my database for future use. Well, you know, it sounds like I have a little time on my hand, so I'm going to head back to the mess hall and prepare for our Space Monopoly game. Okay, and I have some spare time, so uh, if you want to take a break, I can take over your station for you. Uh, no. No, 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 no. No one is taking over this station again until I personally check them out on its operation. I'll tell you what, since you have so much free time, why don't you go ahead and start a new round of Space Monopoly with Commander Collins? That's a great idea. I don't really think I should. Oh, but you were just telling me yesterday how much you enjoy a rousing game of Space Monopoly. 
Well, you know, hey, since it's going to be the three of us, let me go ahead and start the Space Monopoly game back at the mess hall. And in fact, I think we'll be finished in six months this time. Oh, I'm going to get you for that one. You better sleep with one eye open. I cannot wait to see how that Space Monopoly game ends up. Mm. Aurora, please pull up the, the log for the period of time that Dr. Carafano was running communications. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Yes, yeah, Specialist Barber. Hmm. Well, I got those. That's done. I can finish that one later. Wait. What in the world? Uh, Aurora, since when do we have a self-destruct activation system installed on the station? You have some explaining to do, young lady. I'm waiting. This concludes Episode 7 of SpaceGate Station. Feel free to access our other recorded episodes for student instruction in STEM-related topics. Transmission terminated.